Thank you, Zainab. Thank you to Google. Thank you, Bernard. Um, I'm not going to get stuck on this, but there is a definitional term uh, about this word populism. And as I say, I'm not going to get stuck on definitions, but uh, the problem with every word that is uh, effectively used as a cordon sanitaire <laughs> is that there's always a political temptation to extend it slightly further than it should be extended for your own personal short-term political gain. There is a possibility that in some of the cases we're talking about at the moment, that is one of the things that is going on, that it's a, a useful term to decry anything that is what you don't like, or indeed sometimes anything that is just popular, as we used to call it. Um, the, first, the second thing I wanted to mention was uh, the issue of bullet dodging. Uh, when I was starting off in my career, somebody once said to me, uh, there are two types of journalists who get killed as war reporters, people who've never done it before, and people who've done it all their lives. People who've done it for such a long time that they become slightly blasé about it. Um, and Europe is slightly at risk of that second thing at the moment in relation to this thing, if we agree to call it populism. I mean, uh, last December, everyone celebrates uh, um, the Austrian Freedom Party uh, loses uh, 46 uh, to 54. Um, and everyone says, hurrah, we've killed the populists. Uh, after the Dutch elections in March, they say, thank goodness, Gert Wilders' Freedom Party only came second. And then they say, after last night, thank goodness a member of the Le Pen family has only got a third of the French vote. I think we don't keep dodging these bullets. Now, if there's a uh, reason, by the way, that I think this will get a lot worse and why, if you really want a very, very gloomy prognosis, but nevertheless a page turner, I refer to all of this in my book, um, <laughs> doom, doom mongering has never been such fun. Um, but uh, uh, if there's a reason for that, it is in part because at gatherings like this one, not that there are very many, but uh, gatherings of this nature, absolutely everything that the public is concerned about in these areas is totally off limits. Uh, everything that you would say publicly, everything that can be discussed publicly here, pretty much is off limits to the general, uh, uh, from comparison to what the general public think. And let me just give you a couple of very quick examples of that. I was so glad that Zainab and uh, Tony Blair earlier uh, got on to some of this. But just, just consider the following. These are three polls from 2013 uh, in Europe. A poll in 2013 in Germany found that 7% of the German public said they associate Islam at all with tolerance or respect for human rights. Uh, a poll that same year in France said that, found that 67% of the French public think that Islam is, quote, incompatible with the French state and 73% of the French in 2013 said that they viewed the religion very negatively. That was, of course, two years before the major attacks in Paris and elsewhere. Um, that same year, 68% of the Dutch public said that there is, quote, enough Islam in the Netherlands. And uh, you can agree or disagree with Mr. Orban, but he has the Hungarian populace on his side for the views he takes. And this poses a very serious uh, question for gatherings like this one and political elites and political mainstreams across Europe. Because there is a tendency, and I don't wish to abuse the hospitality of my hosts or the previous speaker, but there is a tendency to do what Mr. Blair did earlier, which is to say this is a perception problem. We need to correct the perceptions, effectively, of the public. The public think the wrong thing, we need to correct that. Uh, you hear this, I don't want to name the publications, but there are publications in this country and elsewhere that have the same view. The public got it wrong on Brexit. We will keep writing sparkling editorials and brilliant monographs until they get it. And it may just be, and it's certainly my view, the case that the public are not necessarily wrong. Um, what Mr. Blair said about perceptions and immigration and so on is very telling uh, to my mind. Let me give you one other um, pertinent uh, set of figures. The British Social Attitudes Survey, uh, which is a pretty good marker uh, uh, of these things in Britain, uh, has asked uh, for a number of years the British public uh, their views on immigration and the views of the British public who want immigration to be reduced by, quote, a lot. In 2011, 51% of the British public said that. In 2013, 56% of the British public said that. And by 2014, 77% of the British public were saying that. Now, 
it's possible for a political class to keep saying, you the people just don't see the real world. We the political elites live in it, get with it, get with the program, join us. The problem is that the public may not be thinking that and saying that because of some fantasy populist thing. It may not be saying that because of a press magnet or a political leader who they disagree with. They may be saying it because the facts have changed in their countries and that they see the facts changing every day. And like the publics in France and elsewhere, they see a lot of bad uh, um, uh, results of this. And it's not that their perception is the problem. The problem is that the facts have changed and the political class keeps on trying to tell them you're wrong on your facts. Now, there are some people who are trying to catch up with this, obviously in France, uh, uh, but I, and I would uh, give you a couple of quotes of people. And if I didn't tell you who, who said these things, uh, you would tell me this must be a populist, this must be a Le Pen or something like this. Uh, um, just as he was running for the French, French presidency and, of course, failed, former President Nicolas Sarkozy, quote, in France, the only community that matters is the French community. If you want to become French, you speak French, you live like the French. Uh, who, uh, who would you think said, um, before a recent election, act normal or go away? And if you live in a country where you get so annoyed with how we deal with each other, you have a choice. Get out. You don't have to be here. Mark Rutte, the head of the Dutch Liberal Party and Prime Minister of Holland. So there is a change in rhetoric. I don't particularly think that's for the better, because the problem is the change in rhetoric doesn't add up to a change in actions. And indeed, it's possible that you can uh, uh, lead the public along with a change in your rhetoric for a while. But unless the uh, realities change, uh, it's unlikely that the public and the political class are going to meet again. Uh, I uh, don't want to go on too much with figures, but let me give you just one other thing which strikes me as being pertinent speaking to this divide. Earlier this year, uh, in his first days in office, when President Trump introduced a temporary moratorium on travel from a number of countries, the Muslim-majority countries, there was outrage across the world. There was... Uh, uh, um, outrage in uh, the media class, outrage across the political class, and of course in Europe, in gatherings like this one, absolute outrage that a man could be so appalling and base and low as to institute a temporary travel ban on people from several countries. The interesting thing to me was that a few days after that, Chatham House think tank in London uh, released a poll of European opinion on a much harder question than the one Mr. Trump was suggesting. Uh, Chatham House asked uh, the populations in 10 European countries if they agreed or disagreed with the, with the sentence, all further migration from mainly Muslim countries should be stopped, much harder than what Mr. Trump was suggesting. Uh, of that question, 8 out of 10 European countries, their public said in a majority that they agreed with that decision, and that included Germany, and it included France, and one of only two countries, the other being Spain, where most people didn't agree with that sentiment was this one, Britain, where, again, a mere 47% of the public agreed with it. So it would seem to me that we've had a problem, and one of them is that as the public, not to be too gross in our left-right divisions, as the public turns to the right, the political class rushes to the left. I would argue, and finally, that in this country there has been some mending of this. You may agree with Brexit or disagree with it. What is one of the results? Local council elections the other day and UKIP are wiped out. The uh, right, as it were, of the political spectrum, which has been on maneuvers for 25 years now since the Maastricht Treaty, has united. The populists, as it were, did their job, and now the Conservative Party has reached out, got them, and it turns out that this is mainstream opinion after all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
I don't think so. It's a question of political uh, activity. It is clear that there is in Europe a real uneasiness, not to say more, among the uh, minorities from Muslim origin. But it is true also that you have among them some very brave women and men who fight for secularism, for equality between men and women, and so on. The real question is not to perceive, is to help, to extend the hand, to encourage, to give hope and courage to those who, at the expense of their own living or life, battle inside Islam against Islamism. The real battle of our days is inside Islam, between Islam and Islamism. In this battle, we have a role to play, which is not to perceive, but which is to help. Number three, uh, there is no, you say that uh, uh, some people act as if there was them and the real world. No, there is two real world. There is the real world of the mobs fighting against each other, and there is the real world of Europe, citizenship, and so on. The real risk today is not to see the world of nations just replace the world of EU. The real risk is to see our peoples going back, not only to wars at the First and the Second World War, but war in general. La guerre de tous contre tous, wars ab about borders, wars between communities, and so on. There is two worlds, two conceptions of people of Europe, of us, fighting today. And my last mm -hmm. remark, when Sarkozy said that, uh, that to be French is to embrace Okay, but the real problem of populism is to say that when you are born abroad, you have no possibility, no right, no chance to embrace French language, French culture, and French identity. This is a real dividing line. Okay, thank you. I let you go on a little bit longer because you did have a little bit more than your eight minutes, but please, for your right of reply, do stick within the two minutes. Thank I'll you. Try to, I'll try to go under make up. Um, uh, just quickly, yes, uh, there, there does remain a definitional problem with this, and as I say, the, the tendency to use it as a pejorative term of anything one doesn't like politically does stand, I think. Uh, if you were to read out some of the things Hillary, uh, Hillary Clinton said on the campaign trail, for instance, when she boasts about being the only candidate being attacked by Wall Street, if you didn't know it was Hillary Clinton saying that, you, this would fit a lot of the definitions we might come up with Wall Street, them and us, banker class against us, common people, and so on. So, as I say, I, I don't deny that such a thing can exist. I simply think that it has been extended further than it should have been extended, and that that extension takes in, unfortunately for many people, the majority of the publics of Europe. The second point, if I may, is very quickly about this point. It's a very important point you made about uh, uh, reformers and so on. Of course, before, before uh, Europe had the wars of nation states, we had the wars of religion. And the people who think that the abolition of the nation state or the unification of the nations in the EU will get rid of war, of course, always have this problem before them, that this continent tore itself apart over religion, and some of us can see that happening again at some stage. And if there's a downside to this, it is, Bernard, as you know better than anyone, the fact that the very reformers you and I speak about and the very reformers you and I know are the immigrants who are most under threat it is the reformers who go around in bulletproof jackets. It is my reformist friends who live in fear for their lives in London. It is not the brotherhood people or the people who are wanting to do dawa. It is the reformers every single time. And when people say uh, from non-Muslim communities, why don't more people stand up? That's the reason, because the assassin's veto is amazingly strong, and we ignore it at our peril. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Douglas. And BHR Bernard Henri. I mean, I think with the perfect, I mean, we don't want to go into definitions, but it is worth noting that when we talk about populism, it's also on the left Podemos in Spain, Syriza in Greece, and the Five Star Movement in Italy, who've also <coughs> mounted quite an assault on the mainstream parties. So both on the right and the left, but as you say, the voice of the people, some people think, is, is the way of ruin. Um, I'm going to go to the, to the floor in a minute, but just to, to ask you first, Douglas. Um, Really, you've boiled the arguments down to anti-immigration, really, mm -hmm. and al almost anti-Muslim immigration mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. the essence of your argument. You think if there were no more Muslim immigrants coming into the United Kingdom, for instance, or other EU countries, that that would be the panacea to everybody's no. worries? No, I don't. <coughs> um, and it's not a policy, by the way, I agree with. 
Um, what I do think is happening consistently is that the publics in Europe are saying, slow it down. Just slow it down. It takes such a long time for a society to feel the effects of immigration of the mm. scale we have had recently in Europe. It takes a very long time. We're still talking in Britain about the Huguenots. <laughs> and the Huguenots were French Protestants. If anyone honestly thinks that it's going to be easier for the Eritrean community to go to Norway than it is for a French Protestant to move to Britain in the 18th century, then we're really kidding ourselves. Well, having said that, the Eritrean does have the badge of colour. The French, the Huguenots, always had the possibility of assimilation because once they've been there for a long time and speak the language and so on, nobody can differentiate. But when you are of a different colour, you never have that real possibility of complete assimilation. You will always stand out. So there is a difference. But uh, just very, very quickly again on this, um, you know, people often, and I like to decouple them, talk about Muslim immigration and also talk about the terror threat. But we've seen in both the United Kingdom and France that the terror threat from within has come from British-born and bred yes. Muslims. Yes. Um, people who, you know, have a mm -hmm. Yorkshire accent, as we saw in um, the, the London transport mm -hmm. attacks in 77. Um, so how does that fit into your arguments? How does stopping new people coming in from Muslim-majority countries make people feel any safer here? Yes, this is one of the fascinating things. Of course, after the attack, uh, the murder of the policeman in Paris the other day, everyone waited. Marine Le Pen, of course, went off early and talked about immigration. Of course, yet again, it turns out to be a homegrown uh, French-born citizen. Uh, so th these things are not separate, of course. Again, it goes back to this thing, if there's an overwhelming feeling, it is the European public saying, slow it down. It's clearly not going brilliantly at the moment, so why would you speed the process up? And that seems to me not to be an illegitimate point. 